Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the fourth offering in our Scholars in the Square series. I'm pleased to uh, see people here in person and on Zoom. Hello, Zoom, and also in the future uh, through our YouTube channel. The format is no longer new, but it's still kind of new to some folks. So I'll just say that you're about to hear a 20 minute uh, public talk by Dr. John Nelson. Following John's talk, our colleague from the Religion, Culture, and Society program, Dr. Martin Adam, will join me for a 20 minute conversation with John. And then we'll spend our last 20 minutes in conversation with the roughly 20 people in the room and whoever else is with us through Zoom. Our speaker today is John Nelson, a visiting fellow at the CSOS. John joins us after a long and productive career at the University of San Francisco. There, he was professor of East Asian religions in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, with a special interest in the interaction between religion and the politics in East Asia. He's the author of Experimental Buddhism, Innovation and Activism in Contemporary Japan, the co-editor of the Handbook of Contemporary Japanese Religions, two books on Shinto in Contemporary Japan, numerous articles and documentary videos on Japanese religion. Now he's with us to work on a book uh, about a long journey he took through East Asia about a decade ago. Of course, no one travels alone. One always takes one's mind, body, nationality, gender, privileges, crises, and preconceptions. Not only do we see through these lenses when we look at and interact with worlds that are not our own, but we also impact those worlds at the same time. And so I want to acknowledge with respect to the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory, the university stands and the Songhees, the Squimalt, and the Sanish peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to stay. Given the interest among my friends in religious studies, in the religions with which we were raised, and those that beguile, infuriate, and fascinate us later on, I look forward to hearing about the ways John now looks back on his journey. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and to Rachel and Scott and Noriko, who's not here today, for their support of this project. Mm -hmm and to the center for having me again as a research fellow. The first time I was here was 2007. And from 2007 to 2013, I've learned a lot about my uh, research interests and how a university works and how the world works in general. Also a big thanks to my partner, Miko, for putting up with scholarly activities two years into retirement. <laughs> a, um, so this, this presentation is informal. It's directed to the folks in the room, not an undergraduate audience. So I'm going to take a few liberties and maybe push you a little bit to absorb what you see on the screen because we start off slow, but uh, we quickly move into some more detailed images and um, discussion. So the point of religion growing like this is because there's not so much, um, what's the right word, literacy about Asia in North America. It seems like this very far distant place. It's really a, a geographical term. It doesn't really apply to this enormous landmass that is about four fifths of the whole European Asian landmass. So the um, trends and the experiences that I had in 2013, 2014 have grown into movements and businesses and uh, institutions and far-flung networks, the reach of social media's power, the shifting identities of human beings, the use of religion by politicians to advance agendas. Now all of this seems commonplace, but in 2013 and 2014, it was cutting edge stuff. So we'll move into where we're going with this talk. And some of the slides will come very quickly. It's a book project, so it's not an article. What I'm gonna to try to give you today is an overview of the entire book in about uh, 18 minutes. So positionality, intersectionality, this is a new way of thinking about a term in anthropology that has been around for a long time, which is reflexivity. And when you're a reflexive anthropologist, you think about everything that you bring to the field, everything you bring to your research. And that includes um, a slide we'll see in a moment. We will have a slide for defining terms, and also the motivating question for some of this research. And finally, we'll see key themes and conclusion and provocations. <clears throat> this is a slide that is my um, approximation, I guess you could say, of positionality. And there's a lot going on here, so I'm just gonna go through it very quickly, but it was, it was fun to put together. 
this is not a mandala as people know mandalas, but I'm calling it a mandala because it positions yourself at the center of this world. Habitus is a word that now kind of substitutes for um, positionality. They're not equal exactly, but habitus was a term launched by Pierre Bourdieu in the 1970s. And it's had a great track record for um, helping people understand where they are when they're in the field. The base here means your home base. And maybe that's a house, maybe it's an apartment, maybe it's a sleeping bag on a sidewalk someplace. But I wanted to acknowledge the diversity of your home base and then place it alongside work and the world. This is a person's understanding, I think, of where they are in the world at any given moment, but it's moving and it's not arranged in any sort of hierarchy. One takes importance over the other. And then you have religion, you have politics, you have economics, you have uh, global exchanges that all impact upon this self at the center of this world. And I hope this makes sense. There's a certain logic to it. Each one of these uh, dimensions to the mandala could be discussed in more detail, but we're going to keep moving and uh, see what's next here. The, the reflexive self in play or the wheel of power or privilege or positionality, uh, this is an interesting, I guess you could say, um, composition of many different parts. And but basically when you're a cultural anthropologist, and you go into the field, you are observing everything that you possibly can, and you're participating in as much as you can, or as much as you're allowed to participate. The positionality then connects with intersectionality, and intersectionality becomes a term or a, uh, a phrase, and I'm quoting here from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, that intersectionality refers to particular forms of intersecting oppressions. For example, intersections of race and gender. Oppressions work together in producing injustice. That's pretty concise. It can be unpacked and taken into many other dimensions, but this is what I'm using for this talk, to think about this. And of course, who I am as a person right now, as a white male uh, educated person from a small town in Kansas who has pursued education as far as I can and got a job at the university. I mean, it puts me in a privileged position and I understand that, but I don't apologize except for the ancestors whose shoulders my family relied upon to get here and apologize for the barbarities that they created for native peoples in North America. But I won't apologize for my own position in this society. Um, we'll take it from there. So in a ethnography and a multi-site ethnography, which I think is the next, so the next slide, because we're defining terms, um, this is a key term, this multi-site uh, positionality. So defining terms very quickly, the, the title of this talk, well, it deals with religions and spiritualities. It has adventures in it. It has Asia, Asia's in it. And then there's a research design behind all of this. So very quickly, we just look at an anthropological take on religion, which is as a social force. And we see that it is culturally constructed and conditioned. I'm, I'm certainly not going to read all this to you. But if you look at the next to the last one, religions are diverse. So we should add an S. I don't study Buddhism. In fact, I don't think there is anything called Buddhism. There are Buddhisms, just as there are Christianities. You cannot say that the Christianity in Africa today is the same as the Christianity in Rome or in Denmark or in Los Angeles. So this great diversity, just by adding an S, you pluralize and you make it much more interesting. You make it more social in a way to add the S. So with our modern period, one of the things that has happened is to um, make or render a social position for the individual that allows them to negotiate their stance with religion. We have spiritualities, which are part of religions, but I'm gonna skip over that to focus on adventures. Um, it's a provocative word. It means an unusual, exciting, and possibly dangerous activity. And certainly there was plenty of that on this eight month, well, actually it was a little bit longer than eight month, nine month trip. Um, 
Some of that is in the is in the travel blog that intersects with the religious scholarship that I will be adding to the travel blog. But it all takes place in East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and then Middle Asia. And again, as I said, Asia is this very greatly diverse and vast territory that doesn't <coughs> really connect with the term. So the term Asia comes from the Assyrian. And it simply means to the east. And it was a term picked up by the Greeks to talk about landforms to the east of the peninsula of the Greek peninsula uh, 2,500 years ago. The research design for this talk and also for the book is a multi-site ethnography. And by that, I mean that you have these interactive topics, interactive issues that you privilege over the long-term personal relationships. My previous two books on Shinto in Japan looked at a shrine in Nagasaki and a Shinto shrine in Kyoto, both of them quite important places. But I did have a long-term relationship with the priests and the parishioners of those locations. It was extremely stressful because the Japanese are polite, officious, and exacting people. And so to how to learn to work with them and be in that society for a long period of time was very educational and humbling. So I'm grateful for that. But my book on experimental Buddhism allowed me to work in a system like you see here, where you have nodes of places and nodes of individuals in these places. So it's a distributed knowledge system. And the information that comes from one of these places, one of these <coughs> nodes, can connect with the other locations. And it's, it's I found it extremely useful that somebody way out on the edge in uh, Kyushu or in Nagasaki would say something profound that would connect with a person in the northern part of Japan. And I could bring those together through this research design. So I'm grateful for that. The motivating question, yes, what is that? And here it is. Um, how does a person navigate, accept, modify, and apply key religious and or spiritual teachings to their lives, work, and to worlds? It's very abstract and general question, but when you're going from country to country or culture to culture or interview to interview, you can ask this question. Well, how do you relate to the Islam that your family taught you and your community practices now? And that's an interesting question to ask somebody who is 20 years old or 25 years old or 50 years old or 70 years old. So um, the first image here is of a, let me see if I can get my slide, a, uh, just a wall on, in Athens. And you notice the red flyer right in the middle of it, which says, I believe after a Google translation, uh, ever work on Sunday? We do not work, we do not shop, not another step back into the working middle ages. And you know that's a position. Is it a religious position? It could be a religious position. It could be disguised to hide a religious position, but there it is along with some other posters. Um, we go from there to the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, a fantastic place, but it was built after a military defeat as a way to show that, well, we still have power, we still have resources, we still have a closeness to God or to Allah. And the next one is a little bit further to the east, five young women sitting at the Red Fort in Delhi, India. And for them, as well as for these students at Karimunjawa, a small island about 80 kilometers off the coast of Java, it's going to be a, a difficult world to navigate and negotiate because as they grow older they're going to be facing climate change india is already struggling with extremely high temperatures and karimunjawa is going to be struggling with sea level rise um, in the next 20 years for sure so these kids are going to be alienated from the their homeland as it changes and as part of it goes underwater but they will also be pushed into a new environment that provides opportunities they probably can't imagine at the moment. So it's not a win-win situation, but it's not a win-lose situation either. The key themes of the book, you can see these uh, quickly, and I'm talking too much and not moving quite quickly enough. So we're just going to look at them 
the religious affiliation. I like this slide. I wanted to show it to you because it brings together rational thought, emotion, action, and also noticing and accepting or not accepting the premises of a religious tradition. The sacred places in the world that I visited, one of them that first came to mind was Borobudur in Java, which is this fantastically uh, elaborate and very, very large temple built in the eighth, ninth, eighth or seventh century after a Hindu regime was destroyed by that big volcano in the back. And the Buddhist temple of Borobudur has fantastic uh, bas relief uh, sculptures along each one of the terraces. So you're walking around this mandala and you're following the terraces as they tell the story of a young man who decides to become a bodhisattva. And a bodhisattva is a, a Buddhist, I guess you could say a saint, who says that I'm not going to be entering nirvana, the ultimate salvation, until everybody else enters nirvana. So we go from here, this sacred place, and I put sacred in quotes because a sacred place is a place that is uh, problematic. It can have any content. It doesn't really matter what you consider to be sacred as long as somebody believes it to be sacred. You can have sacred temple in Varanasi, India that has um, monkeys and rats as an object of divinity. And that's kind of hard for some of us to understand, but as long as there is a consensual agreement that this is the sacred object, it, it seems to work. So the sacred is always something of extraordinary power and reality to the person who believes in that interpretation. From here though, we go to a sacred place, which is not in Asia, it's in, it's in Norway. And you look at the picture and you say, oh, well, sure, it's a sacred place, I recognize the location, Norway, it's a nice rainbow and there's a wonderful bridge. But if you look a little closer between the rainbow and the bridge, you see a strip mine. And that could be a sacred site to a person who owns the strip mine. So again, it's just an example of how sacred is a very malleable con content and can work in many different ways around the world. The world culture and the heritage of religions is something that I found fascinating. And there's just no end to it whenever you take a long trip. So here we see outside uh, Yogyakarta, Indonesia, a group of tourists who are Muslim, who are dancing to a native tune uh, led by a person who is has longer hair right in the middle of the, in the, of the photograph. In the far distance, you see a Hindu monument because the whole area was Hindu. Uh, until uh, a big earthquake and the volcanoes uh, destroyed that earlier uh, movement in Borobudur. So to me, this is fascinating to see people dancing to a native tune. You have layers of society. You have a shamanic layer as well in Indonesia that honors the ancestors in a very real and tangential way, uh, a very real and, and tangible way, uh, three times a year. So this type of religious background becomes a resource for politicians and they can work this into a uh, position and a ideology that we'll see in just a moment in Turkey and in India. So the idea here is not to think about it, just to do it, just to follow the ritual, go ahead and uh, move along. The, the new Islam in, 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 Isla, in Indonesia came from Saudi Arabian funding. And with a country that has the highest number, highest percentage of the population that is Muslim, uh, there are three types of Islam that's practiced, a traditional, reform, and a political. And so here we see a reform-political uh, movement in Indonesia that connects with local politicians. And the mosques are not shy at all about broadcasting a call to prayer and then making an announcement about a political rally that's going to happen in the neighborhood. It doesn't happen at the mosque, but it does happen in the neighborhood. We go then to, is to Istanbul, where it's a newly revived Islam since the year 2014, and this is when I was there. Um, my guide for touring the Hagia Sophia 
uh, mosque, which it is now, but originally it was built as a church. And uh, she was a wonderful person because she was a feminist and we could relate and talk to each other through that particular lens. Religiously inspired nationalism is something that we see in Turkey, in India, in Indonesia to a certain degree, but certainly in Japan and even today in Japan. It started in the 1860s and then blossomed into a, a major nation state that became problematic in the 1930s and 1940s as it bowled its way through Asia. So here's this picture from Osaka in 1939. And here's one from 2020. The group is still, this is not a group. One of the groups is a soldiers military, military group. The other one are private citizens who have aligned into a Nippon Kaigi or the Japan Society, which is very, very active and influences a number of politicians. In fact, Abe Shinzo, the politician that was assassinated a couple of years ago, his cabinet had 12 out of 15 people who had this um, affiliation with the, this uh, right-wing group. So um, I'm a patriot, I'm a nationalist, I'm a born Hindu. This is what we hear in India. And it also is what we hear in Turkey. And it continues in Japan because you see a place like this in the forest, but it is a Shinto shrine now that used to be a Buddhist temple and was completely converted in 1876. All right, religious diversity, just a few photos here. The cremation of a councilman's wife in Bali was a real wake up for me because it lasted three days and was phenomenally complicated. In Greece, we have two guardian chapels atop hills that protect a valley from the god of Islam, the god of Italian Catholics that were also an invading force, and the god of Christians as well. We have a number of photos here that are just without captions because it still is religious diversity. And the question, I think, is how many gods are there? How many divinities are there? That is basic to the study of religious diversity. We see in Hinduism a multiplicity of gods. In the middle picture is a dancer in Bhaktipur, Nepal, who was dancing around in a circle and then turned and looked right at me and just came at me very quickly. And I could escape with my life, I felt like, and just barely made it out of there. We have a corpse ready to be cremated. We have nuns studying for an exam in a curriculum that takes 16 years to complete. We have a whole abbey made by the wife of the youngest brother of the Dalai Lama. He's the gentleman in the white shirt. His wife, Rinchen, is beside, her, beside him. And she worked for a decade to raise the funds to create these monasteries and these abbeys for people who escaped from Tibet and wanted to be educated. So I spent uh, Christmas day with them and really benefited quite a lot from the conversations I had. Climate change, this is my next to last slide. We know that it's going to be a huge, huge factor in the future. So Karimunjawa is a small island. It looks like a pristine place, but that is going to be underwater in the next 20 to 30 years. And the pristine, beautiful beach you see there, if you walk up just a few more steps, you find the area with trees and bushes to be completely full of trash and waste and debris that arrives there during the high tide. The last picture is, well, I think the picture from China is fairly self-evident, uh, the lowlands and the Delta River, they're going to have a huge challenge. But the Machu Puchare area north of uh, Pokhara is an area that looks normal, but the erosion is terrible there. And they've had extremely heavy rains as part of the monsoon season. So my final slide here is that there are rough days ahead for the entire world, the entire planet. It doesn't mean that we're completely doomed, but it does mean that it's worth traveling now in order to see the world and know what's worth preserving and know what might be compromised or will be compromised. It's also worth traveling to see the members of the human family that we inhabit 
and how very different they are, but also how much we share. It's also worth traveling to see how your approach to danger and adversity can also lead to a satisfaction that is a very tangible satisfaction and helps you balance your experience of danger and adversity. And finally, I think it's important to seek and apply a calm, uncluttered perspective, which can empower your life. The last picture here is that one blows away, is of hang gliding over the lake near Pokhara. That's my son with a uh, hang gliding pilot. And thank you very much. Is that 20 minutes? It was roughly 20 right. minutes. 20 Sorry. Minutes, 25 -ish. Oh, no. <laughs> it's okay, it's fine. So maybe you could just begin to stick okay. uh, oh, yeah. together. And when now we enter part two of this process. So I'll let Martin, um, I'm just here to lubricate the conversation. Sure. Well, uh, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for that kind of tour de force whirlwind uh, around the world uh, in 20 minutes kind of experience. Yeah, tough. yeah. yeah. so uh, I want to uh, ask you uh, maybe a little bit to, I'm glad you ended where you did because I, one of my questions was going to be, well, what's the takeaway from all of this? Where do you want, what do you want the readers of your book to come away with? Mm -hmm. And I see that you you do have a, a kind of an idealist and a optimistic moral, uh, you can say goal for your book. Yeah, to, yeah. To, so I, I could talk about that, but I also wanted to talk about the other end, the starting point, what motivated your, actual uh, decision to go off on this and why do it now? I mean, there's a little bit of that in your conclusion, but what was actually personally motivating you? And this ties back into uh, Paul's initial introduction where mm -hmm. he talked about the, um, the fact that we carry things with us as we go into right. a journey and turning mm -hmm. our own, including our own crises and all these other things that he mentioned. So if you could talk about start, starting points and, end, and the end point. And, and well, the starting point for this whole trip was failure. And failure is a great motivator because I applied for three grants for a sabbatical that started in 2013. And if you remember what happened before 2013, we had a subprime crisis in North America from about 2008 or 2009, but the housing prices just plummeted and the economy plummeted and funding agencies had their endowments take a big hit. So when I applied for the grants in 2012, the Japan Foundation, the Asia Foundation, and the local university also said no. So I thought, well, I'm not going to spend a sabbatical sitting here in the East Bay of San Francisco. I'm going to go on a big trip. And my wife said, go ahead. So I just yeah. gathered some savings and took off and started in Hawaii, where I, was, um, I gave a talk at the university and was on the radio there. That was cool. And then went to Japan for about uh, three weeks and then down to Bali. And from Bali, I wanted to go and then to Java. From, from Indonesia, I really wanted to go to Myanmar, but there were bombs going off in Yangon and other parts of the country at that time. And I just decided, well, I don't want to be blown up on my sabbatical. I mean, that would be a nice way to end my career, but um, I decided I just didn't need that. So did you have the book in mind all the way as you started off? I or had is that mind, something that grew up as you... I started? had in mind a travel blog. And I was pretty diligent about writing that blog. If you look at some of the entries, which are still accessible uh, through a website called Far West Passage, uh, you can see how, like in, in, in Borobudur, I arrived there with a knee that had been injured <clears throat> on a rather um, dumb but adventurous hike that was led by a guide who didn't know that where the trails were. He said, well, we can just go up to the top of the ridge and then get on the other side and then I can find the trail. But it was muddy and just messy and, oh, we we're just sliding down the side of this mountain and, and I cracked my knee and really did some damage to it. So for the first three days in, in uh, Borobudur, my knee was on ice, but I stayed in a hotel that was the main hotel for researchers when the monument was disassembled and reassembled back in the early 1990s, I believe. So that gave me access to a number of scholarly materials on the, on the place itself. And I, I came out of there feeling like, wow, every tourist should have access to this information because it transformed the way that I interacted with the place and the way that I saw it also. Is that the way, is that how the blog turned into a book? Is it at that point or was it more gradual? I started thinking about the book, yeah, when I was, 
hung up and couldn't go anywhere. And I thought, well, I might as well just write it down and then we'll see what, what comes okay. later on. Yeah. So just uh, 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 that's a little bit about the sort of historical starting point of your journey. I want to talk about your the conceptual starting point. Right. So uh, thinking about uh, the implicit definitions of religion and religious affiliation that you, uh, you're explicit at some points, but I also want to uh, bring in how you understand, we didn't talk about secularism at all. No. And so that's usually the dyad we work with and we begin with and we can, so I, where is, uh, where are you, um, the phenomena that you put under the microscope or that you study, what's the demarcating point? Can you, or is it shifting? And are you bound by your own bracket? You're an anthropologist, right. so you bracket out your own presuppositions about what is religion, but we all know that different societies have yeah, different yeah. conceptions of where religion and non-religion, you know, begin and end. And so, yeah, how do you work with that? And uh, it's, how it's did you a, work with it in this It's project? a tough thing to work with because when I left Hawaii, after having toured a number of the Buddhist temples yeah. there, and also going to areas that I considered to be uh, native orientation to the volcanoes and to the highlands and to a big valley on the, on the big island, uh, Waipayo Valley with just these sweeping walls that tsunamis have just plowed into that place about every 15 to 25 years. So I found a very strong shamanic element in Hawaii. And then going to Japan, of course, I knew what to expect in Japan that many people say, well, I'm not religious at all but you wait until somebody dies and they have a Buddhist funeral, or you wait until major holidays and they'll go to a Shinto shrine or to a Buddhist temple. And so that's a real slippery slope to try to figure out, well, are you religious or are you not religious? Is it my definition of religion that is complicating things here? It seems so simple to the people. Oh, this time of year, you do this, this time of year, you do this, and they don't see any contradiction at all. Maybe because they don't believe in anything, but they do believe in the practice of ritual. And ritual is a very, very important factor in many of these religions. By the time I got to Bali, everybody seemed to be religious. Mm -hmm. And Indonesia, 88% of the people are Muslim. So you know that they are bound to particular uh, mosques and traditions of Islam, but there are Buddhists and there are Christians. I was a visiting scholar at the Jesuit University in Yogyakarta. And I was there on two different occasions and was presenting uh, my the, the basic theory of my book, Experimental Buddhism or Experimental Religion. What does that mean? Well, just so what we talked about today, that people will get an idea and they'll try something out. They'll try to be a Buddhist and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. But if that doesn't work, then they'll try maybe another type of Buddhism or they'll go into another type of religion completely different from what they grew up with. But now we have the choice to do that. And I think that's a very significant uh, development of the modern era that even, even women right, have the choice now to make a, make a decision about how to be religious and how devo devoutly they're, pra they're practicing their religion. Hmm. Yeah, so yeah, the, the things have changed with the globalized world, right? We've now got Very this smorgasbord so. before us. Mm -hmm. One can, we can talk about that. Um, I don't know, Paul, if you have any, anything that you'd like to chime in, I'm sort of monopolizing, monopolizing the questions here. But. That's okay. I mean, I guess I'm curious, John, what, what in your in your journey has actually challenged your own perceptions of yourself or your or the field? Every, I'm every, country, every country that I went to, because yeah. I had been to India before and I had made a trip around the world before, but that was in 1979. Mm -hmm. When I was a young man straight out of Japan, I'd spent two and a half years in Japan. I did not want to go back directly to North America. So I said, well, I'm just going to take a long trip. I'll just go the other way. And that was eye-opening because every country I went into, I felt, I felt very humbled and I wouldn't say diminished, but I had a high impression of myself as a person who'd been a teacher in Japan and I had all this money and okay, let's go see the world. Whoa, the world was much bigger, much more complicated, much more difficult to navigate than I could ever have imagined. I felt the same way on this trip in 2013. And I think that's part of why I wanted to do the trip is to have a, uh, a reconstruction of myself because going to Bali and seeing how people live there very simply, but in a ritual way that 
they were just seemed like they were constantly making objects to put on an altar or going to a, a ritual or going to some big uh, celebration in the city that had connections to uh, the type of Hinduism that's practiced in Bali. Um, it was all very, very uh, profound for me. And that's why I wanted to write about it too, because I knew that if I just tried to soak it in and remember it through the photographs that I took, it would be a failure. Mm -hmm. And my writing, I don't think it's a failure, but it still is an approximation of what I experienced at that time. So have yeah. you have you noticed since your young days of traveling yeah. and so on, have you noticed changes in the way that religion is manifesting in society and cultures around the world? Like, uh, you've talked a little bit about nationalism. We right. see that, I don't know, that's been around for a long time, of course, you know, mm -hmm. as you've mm -hmm. noted in Japan. But but I'm thinking of India, for example, right. the rise of Hindutva, and you know it's also the land of Gandhi. We have these great traditions of, of universalism coming out of India, of course, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. very much part and parcel of the Indian identity. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious as to your perceptions of religious change in some of these countries. You you know you're uh, now Professor Emeritus, and you've seen a lot over over the years. What are your observations about? the way that religious developments are happening. Okay, well, I'll try to be brief about this. Um, what I've seen happening in religion, when I went to India the first time, uh, Mrs. Gandhi was the leader. She was still very much alive and very powerful and had big billboards beside all the roads about how important it is <clears throat> for all Indians to unify and to have a, not a, a fragmented idea of the nation. She wanted Muslims and Hindus and Christians and Buddhists to all get along with each other and to cooperate in this nation building project of India. Wow, it really changed a lot with uh, the BJP and their mm -hmm. um, big campaign to rebuild the Hindu temple on the site of the deity Ram in Ayodhya. And that mosque I think came down in 1991 or so, yeah. and that caught my attention. And I followed India and taught about India in my classes. Mm -hmm. And the way that rational thought and decision-making has been subsumed into an emotional approach to not only religion and, and Hinduism, but this, uh, this movement called Hindutva. Mm -hmm. And Hindutva, I think, is, is like the slide that we saw, which says, I am patriot. I am nationalist, I am Hindu. And that combination is not intellectual, it's not rational, it's an emotional mm -hmm. uh, combination. And all you have to do is kind of show up mm -hmm. and follow the crowd. And that indicates yeah. who yeah. you are at this time. And we see it all over the place. We see it in Turkey, we see it in Indonesia to a certain degree, we see it in North America and in the United States with uh, a regime that still wants to be in the headlines but maybe it's going to be in the in court instead in the headlines. <laughs> but there's a very large movement in uh, America that is a white supremacist, white nationalist, white religious movement that I think is quite dangerous because they're ready to go to war. They're heavily armed. They're just waiting for a right opportunity to start shooting people. Hopefully it won't happen. And hopefully the ele next election will bring us a president who understands the situation and knows how to navigate through all of this. But that, that group is not going away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're traveling around the world, you know, to the, to the world, especially in Asia, uh, they might look at you and say, well, you look like one of those guys. Yeah, <laughs> really. In other words, you're American, you're white, you're, <laughs> That's uh, you're exactly American, right. white, good looking, uh, educated, uh, professional. With lots of money. The good <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just embellishing it in a nice way. As a host, as one does. Um, so I'm just saying, so you you are read as an American right. over there, yeah. as as we are too, actually. Yeah. And that's a complicated misreading in which we correct immediately. Um, <laughs> so I'm just wondering, so the, the sort of dialogues you're having yeah. elsewhere mm -hmm. are inflected by the fact that you know, people around the world are aware of what's happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's uh, so what, what kind of impact did that have on your experience? Well, I think your question says a lot. I mean, asking me about the impact of my experience with other people as I go around the world, I always try to ask them about who they are, 
where they work, what kind of education they have, and the social circles they are involved in. And the social circles is where usually the conversation leads into religion. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know what, I teach religion. I'm very interested in it. If you'd like to talk about it, I'd love to hear what you have to say. And that kind of, ooh, I didn't expect that. So that's, that's one response mm -hmm. very, very briefly. Um, but again, I think going from country to country, week after week, month after month, meeting people, talking to people, um, it's, you know, I keep using this word humbling, but that really is the word. It, it just makes me feel like I'm part of a much greater humanity than I was aware of in San Francisco, in California, as an American. And I'm part of the lives of all of these people that I'm meeting. Maybe I can bring something to them that could help them. The Buddhists that I met in Indonesia, they were, they were feeling very put upon by their Indonesian counterparts who are Islam, hmm. Islamic. And they said, well, what can we do? Our constitution says there's supposed to be freedom of religion. We don't feel free at all. We feel imposed upon. We feel coerced. We feel controlled by the Muslim majority. What can we do? That's a big question, and especially one that's asked in a public setting. Ooh, I have to be careful as a visiting professor there what I say in response. Mm -hmm. So it's very tricky, very tricky. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, beware of Americans offering advice <laughs> that's right. that's on right. foreign yes, policy that's right. in, uh, in, right. in South Asia or Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. Very so good. thank you very much, and thank you very much, Martin. So we're going to now um, make the conversation a little circle a bit uh, broader and have those folks in the room, but also people on Zoom. So people on Zoom, um, please send your questions in and Rachel and Scott will get them to us and we will include them in the conversation. So thank you. So who would like to ask the first question in the room or on Zoom, Rachel? I don't know if there's a queue in the, in the questions. Yeah, I also just have a question. Sure. If I could just jump in. Sure. I think coming back a little bit to Paul's initial question, and how does it change your thoughts on the field? So I'd like to take it um, even to a different level and how did that trip change how you teach religion? Oh, how did it, ch how did it change your interactions with your students in your classroom? But I guess you were retired when you made the trip though, right? Were, were you no, 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 I was no. still so, thick yeah. in the middle okay. of my career. Yeah. Um, I didn't retire until 2021. Okay. So I came back with this wealth of material. I had new slides. I had new video. I had new ex exposure to, uh, Islam's and Buddhism's and Christianity's, and I emphasize pluralizing the different religions around the world. Oh, well, the students thought, oh, I never heard that before. Well, that's pretty interesting, and it worked. That's the important part, is that it worked. And I came back with a new appreciation of ritual. And in fact, if we have one minute at the end of this meeting, I'll teach you a very brief ritual that comes from Shinto, but the nationalistic type of Shinto that has been practiced in Japan for about 150 years. And it's very short, snappy, and helps you interact with the world, I think. It's a good teaser. <laughs> yeah. um, stay tuned, people on Zoom. <laughs> stay tuned, right. Uh, but it just invigorated my teaching. Mm. And I felt like the students were not only interested in the topics, but they wanted to go. They wanted to travel the world. And I, I had a number of students who would come up to me at the end of the semester and say, well, now I want to go to Asia. I want to see some of these places. And I didn't have a slideshow like this. I would divide it up into the different religions groups, but it just transformed my idea of Islam because seeing Islam in Indonesia, in India, in Turkey, wow, that is not the Islam that we see in Saudi Arabia. It is and it isn't, not the social context of it, not the cultural context of it. So all of that worked together in a very positive way. Unfortunately though, when I came back to the university in 2014, I was asked by the Dean to be the administrative, you know, the, the academic head of a graduate program in Asia Pacific studies. Oh no. And whew, we know where that, that's gonna go. That <laughs> went exactly where I thought it was going to go because the program had about 15 students enrolled it was going down the hill, it needed, a, it needed some new blood. And so that's what I put into it, um, blood, sweat, and tears <laughs> for the first couple of years. And then it took off and became a solid program. But it just, it took six, it consumed six years of my life. Mm -hmm. But I could focus on graduate education, which I found very fulfilling, but also one undergraduate class a year. And I really tried to put a lot into that class. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Great. Thank Thanks, you. Rob. Other questions in the room or Zoom? Yeah. So Ambreen on Zoom has a great question, actually. So um, she's saying in a post-COVID world and considering technology that's now easily accessible for most people, how might in-person interactions or experiences be potentially more adventurous, more inspirational than digital interactions or experiences? Or in this kind of post-COVID world, is there a change in that? Is there more opportunity? Or is this me adding on to Ambreen's question? Or is it, do you see that, is there something too still that in-person that you think is particularly important in this ever-expanding digital world? Well, let me throw the question back to you. Rachel, I mean, you do anthropological field work. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that the post-COVID world is a hybrid between in-person meetings and having video streaming and that it works very well to disseminate a great amount of information? Mm -hmm. But there's no replacing people in a room. Um, when you try to teach a class online, it's hard work. <laughs> and you got to push all the right buttons at the right time in order to interact with people. And at my university, they had no obligation to show their face. Mm -hmm. All they had to do was to show up, their name comes on a screen, they had no obligation to talk. That, that was part of the university's official stance to get students to come to class. Yeah, and as a teacher for a class like that, whoo, that was tough mm -hmm. because you had to acknowledge them, hi students. And today we're going to talk about um, religious nationalism in the uh, 1800s in Japan. Mm -hmm. hmm. There were always a few people who were into it and wanted to talk and would show their face, but it was it was very an uphill, very much an uphill climb. Mm -hmm. In a room like this, I feel like I can look at people, see their expressions, and get a read of the room at, at you know just looking around the room and seeing. Well, okay, most people are interested. Nobody's falling asleep. Uh, it's been a fairly successful talk it, by my standards. Um, so I can take all that in in five seconds, but on an online class, you cannot do that. But beyond just the class experience, maybe I'm wondering if um, there's something to be said because you ended with the reasons to travel, the yeah. reasons to get out there and experience it yourself so that we can all experience what you experienced over your nine months. Um, and I guess the question is, um, is it possible to get at some of that complexity, some of that diversity, some of that complicating of categories of religion um, in, through the digital lens? Mm -hmm. or, or do we really need to go and be foot on ground um, to get at some element of what, I, what you're getting at here? Well, I mean, you're talking to an anthropologist, right? And mm -hmm. he's, of course, he's going to say, you have to go into the field, mm -hmm. no matter what the situation is, even if it's a dangerous situation. You have to find local contacts, navigate through the gateways into this dangerous situation. We had anthropologists working in Afghanistan during the Afghanistan war. We had anthropologists working in Iraq and places like that where I would never go because I value my life. But when you're a young person straight out of graduate school and doing this field work might lead to a good high paying job with tenure at a university, and you have good contacts who say, you can come, we'll protect you, you'll be safe here. You tend to believe them and you, you go. So you have to go. But of course, you can also experience a lot online. And I don't want to disparage the online experience, but there's something about this flat screen here as a compared to a person I can reach out and touch right beside me that it's just, you cannot compare the two. You can compare the information you're getting from the two sources, but the interpersonal is by far one that I privilege. Yeah. You know, one of the things I was anticipating hearing from you, and maybe we can tease it out a bit more tomorrow, but I'd, I'd love to get your initial thoughts on it now. I was anticipating hearing from you some kind of grappling with two issues, one of which is what we might call Orientalism, oh. uh, the, the issue that many uh, cultural anthropologists have been dealing with for you know some decades now. And the other one is kind of um, sort of a post-colonial lens that is often used for thinking about new ways of engage, as it were, the West engaging mm -hmm. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And that that didn't seem to be those those two issues, the Orientalist or post-Orientalist approach to Asia or the East, and the kind of uh, post-colonial. Perspective. I wonder 
if that was just so much in the background? Um, maybe it's just assumed by you. It was in the background, but it's part of the history of all these countries that I traveled with. Mm -hmm. So when I'm writing the book, there will be probably a page or two pages on a very brief and essentialized history of the society that I'm going into right now. So people can get a sense of context that is both recent and maybe a uh, hundred years ago, if something really pivotal happened in those societies. And in most of the societies, there was something extremely important that happened in the last hundred years. So I wanna focus on that, but also go into deeper history as well. Because in Japan, you cannot understand the religion of Shinto without understanding the mythology of the country that's been around for almost 2000 years. So I think it's a matter of uh, strategy, how much to include and how much to exclude. The, the post-colonial is something we'll probably talk about tomorrow during uh, coffee time, but I, I look forward to that because there are people in our group of fellows who are much more experienced and articulate about post-colonial studies than I am. It's something that didn't really enter into this uh, context, but you could say that what's happening in India with uh, the BJP is a reaction to the years of, of colonial uh, rule by the British. And it's a reaction to the feeling that Indians are subordinate to other races and other societies in the world. And now that is completely gone. And you can see that the way that uh, Prime Minister Modi was treated by Joe Biden when he came to uh, North America recently in the last few months, I mean, he was treated as an equal and he was, and. India hosted the G20 meetings. So all of this, I think, plays into a sense of history, both recent and more distant, and then the deep past also. So navigating that is, is very tricky, how, how you can do it in a way that doesn't offend people. But even if, if, we, if we think of post-colonialism outside of the national lens, and mm -hmm. we think about actually the way in which that particular critique uh, might inform or challenge the experience of a white male American. I, keep, I hate to keep coming back to that. That's all right. That the experience of you going into those contexts, mm -hmm. but now knowing what we know better about colonialism and post-colonialism and Orientalism and post-Orientalism or whatever, I, that, that's what I'm, I'm curious about whether or not that was again operating <clears throat> in your imagination. Mm -hmm. I, well, I mean, Orientalism is such a huge topic in cultural anthropology that it just, you cannot avoid it. Mm -hmm. And so you, you read the authors that have been influential, Edward Said, Halal Assad, other folks more recent, and it becomes part of your skill set, I think, and how to navigate that when you go into a society, when you talk to people. And people that I met in India, especially, were willing to talk about their parents, their grandparents, and how their lives were affected very deeply and profoundly by the role of the, the colonial powers mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, I'll, look, I'll look forward to hearing more, and yeah. talking more about this tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, Francis? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, oh, sorry, that's okay. I think Francis is the first thing. Yeah, by the way, I'm looking forward to, 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 to the ritual. Yeah, um, oh, the ritual, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, seven minutes left. Yeah, um, you, you mentioned uh, your students wanting to go on their adventures. Yes. And I can imagine it. Uh, to what extent uh, are, is your journey influenced not by your being white, American, or, but by your being a person who's educated in, in the world religions, mm. somebody who is, in a sense, a hybrid, yeah. as we all hybrids, yeah. uh, that you come along, you know, having spent all these, all these years in Japan, you've got the contacts. You, you've got the presuppositions. You're engaging with people from a position, a position of knowledge. Right. Other people are not. Right. Mm. Mm. And you also speak Japanese. I speak of Japanese. Course, yeah. Yeah. I know the Japanese wife. Yeah. Yeah. And I have lived with the Japanese wife for yeah, yeah, yeah. 42 yeah. years, mm -hmm. yeah. which is significant. Mm -hmm. sure. So it is a position of privilege. There's no doubt about it. But it's, it's a hard won privilege that I have worked at and in some cases uh, subordinated myself in order to learn how to behave as a Japanese would behave. Mm. And that's very important when you're studying a religious institution. 
because the Shinto shrines that I worked at, they said, oh, well, you know how to bow, you know how to offer things, you know how to, to place the offering on the altar. And I was allowed to do that. And that's very high privilege to, to have that kind of access. Would you say it's a privilege? Privilege? Would you say it's a privilege or, or just a way of being? It can be both. Why, why does it have to be one and not the other? Yeah, what, what do you have in mind by way of being? Uh, that it seems to me, I think of, of my friend David Shulman, mm -hmm. that if you go to a different culture with, with, with a grounding, with, with a certain sense of identity, then you can learn a lot more. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can be you can be humble in the way that all of us are humble when, mm -hmm. when you're learning things. Uh, we, we don't come along and say, I, I am. I'm so lucky, or I am the, the, the you know, I've, I come along with my skills. Mm -hmm. It's more, more, I come along with the possibilities. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. It's, it's like um, Zen Buddhism has a very famous teacher, Shunju Suzuki, who wrote, or he didn't write, he gave talks that were recorded, and then the talks were transcribed into a book. It's called um, uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And this idea of being a beginner is much more valuable to an established teacher than the expert, because the expert, ex, expert's mind is full of presuppositions. And your, your cup is full of water even before you start drinking it. The beginner's mind, the water's gone, and he's ready for whatever is put into the cup. Whatever is there to drink, I'll drink it. I'll take it. And that nourishes that person. So that expression of uh, being a beginner, having a beginner's mind has been with me ever since I was 22. And that's something I try to cultivate, to work around the expertise that society values as having a, you know, a meritorious type of reward and being somewhat suspicious of that. And knowing that through direct experience, I'm going to have access to a type of knowledge through my body, through my spirit, through my mind also, of course, that I cannot get any other way. So I hope that's a sufficient answer for you. It's the beginning of an answer. It's the beginning. Yeah. Okay, we can continue. To uh, I think last question, yeah. then we get a ritual. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John, for the wonderful presentation. I just a very basic question. Like, what made you choose those countries mm. in oh. Asia, like selections and omissions, and what like kind of presuppositions, if you had any of those countries, and whether they changed during that uh, time? Well, yes, of course, I had presuppositions. Of course, they changed. Every day they changed. Um, by the time I got to Greece, I was exhausted and was feeling very burned out, like I was carrying a, a huge bag of laundry from country to country, and I felt embarrassed about it. <clears throat> and I just, it was raining, and I put myself up in a hotel with several guidebooks, and I said, I have to go someplace that's going to sort of blow my mind. And the place that I chose was the island of Naxos, which is a great place, and I highly recommend it but it's a place that is not really talked about in the guidebooks. They talk about Santorini or other major islands that all the tourists go to. I didn't want to go there. That's the last thing I wanted to do. So I went to this little island where there were very few people. This was beginning of April. Wow, it was fantastic, just fantastic. It had everything I was looking for. My mind got blown. I came back from Naxos to Athens with a very clear spirit and feeling very, very grateful for all that I, all that I had gone through. So I think the, um, the ritual we, we can do would be a ritual of appreciation. And if you're up for it, if, I mean, I didn't answer your question entirely, but no, we can, okay. we we can carry it over till, till yeah. tomorrow. Um, you have to stand up for this ritual. So if you don't mind, we stand up and it's simply two bows. And you, when you bow, you, you bow from your waist. So you bow one time and the second time. This is, these are alpha and omega bows, or yin and yang bows, or yin and yo bows. It's the beginning and the end bows. So this symbolizes your life. This symbolizes how you participate in the world. There's a beginning, there's an end. Okay, let's acknowledge that. Then you put your hands together like this. This is the cool part. <laughs> and you clap twice. Second clap, you leave your hands together, bring your right hand down just a little bit, your right hand down, and then you align your hands together. 
So you've you've enacted a yin and yang dynamic in your claps, and then you bring your hands together. So now everything is balanced, and then you drop your arms, and then you have one more bow. And that last bow is a yang bow or a positive, an alpha bow. You have purified yourself. You have acknowledged the world at large, your position in it, and now you're charged with this spiritual energy and you're ready to go forth again. So let me just show you one more time and you can do it, okay? So one, two, ready? Okay, so if we could look at the mountain, and this is a way of saying thank you to the mountain. Thank you to all of you for coming today on this beautiful day into a room with no windows. <laughs> okay, so here we go. One, two. That is a ritual that I do when I go backpacking, when I'm at the beach, when I have a nice time with people, when I leave. I just want to say thank you. It's a very nice way to do it. So, all right. Thank, thank you. you. Apologies. The one, the one sin you just committed is by not giving us context. Uh, <laughs> this is a Shinto. It's a Shinto ritual. Yeah. yeah. You would, you would not do this at a Buddhist temple. Right. So you said it was an imperial Shinto, Shinto ritual. It's, it is an imperial Shinto ritual. Yes, because all Shinto shrines were made part of the imperial agenda at that time. They were separate, but yeah. and certainly not equal. But um, it is an imperial ritual. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So those of you who are joining us on Zoom, uh, stay tuned uh, or come to join us next week uh, for Matt Orr from Oregon State University. We'll be talking about science, uh, spirituality, and the sustainable future. See you next week. Thanks for coming out today. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.